I began my professional working life, as uh, Giselle has said, in the TAFE system, although as you were talking there I realised that there was a, there's a really interesting gap in my CV of about 10 years where I did some things in my 20s that were a long way out of the university. <laughs> and that gap seems to have disappeared more and more as I've moved on in my career. But I realised that it was actually a really important time for me. Um, in the kinds of jobs that I was involved in. I call it uh, the textile industry and the hospitality and tourism industry, but basically I sewed raincoats and served drinks in bars for a long time <laughs> and, and travelled around the world finding myself, supposedly. Um, but it gave me a very interesting uh, way to come back um, into a professional life. And interestingly, that was in 1979 uh, when I began working at the um, uh, Adelaide Institute of... Uh, of the Adelaide College of TAFE, as it was then, in an adult literacy program. So the TAFE sector then was, I think, quite different from uh, what it is now. Things have changed quite a lot, as I understand it. Um, and I think that a lot of that has been shaped over the past 30 years by what Robin Ryan calls policy windows. These are periods of time that have been radically shaped by policy implementation of critical government initiatives. Um, and uh, shadow cabinet proposals, uh, Australia Reconstructed. I know that some of you were around when Australia Reconstructed was happening. Um, Working Nation, some of these might be familiar. Uh, Skilling Australia for the Future. Another one I came across was Real Solutions for All Australians, a liberal um, uh, policy, I, I gather. Um, so I think over this time too, this has involved a lot of attention to public spending. Um, on social and economic reform um, and, and a focus on a return on investment for that spending uh, that's often, as Giselle said, been referred to as a neoliberal approach to public policy. And I think that takes various forms, but in essence, a lot of those reforms promote privatisation of public services. So we've had an increase in the number of private registered training organisations, uh, for example. But it's also included policy techniques that over time have shifted emphasis from removing the barriers to learning, which was very uh, a strong focus in the 70s and 80s, what I would call the Kangan era of education. Um, and it shifted to policies that, are, in my view, progressively shift blame to individuals for their inability to gain and maintain employment. So this period of time has also included a steady rise in the language of what's called human capital, uh, where we have lives calibrated according to measures of productivity and waste. And over the years I've found this balance between productivity and waste, uh, I can't say enticing, but it's, it, it captivates me the way in which the balance and the polarisation is increasingly used in education and that we've developed a whole set of language practices and policy stra strategies uh, that actually condone um, ways of uh, talking about people as lifters and leaners in, in our nation, as producti productive workers and wasteful citizens who are a drain on the nation. And this has become a kind of legitimate language that we use in education and in broader social policy. And in essence, I suppose tonight, what I'd like to talk about is that education is not neutral in this that we've played a really important role in facilitating some of this language, in fact, even inventing it. Um, that education involves a constant process of selection and alignment with a public culture that approves of demonising those leaners, uh, those who need a leg up, uh, those women who are seeking a place in the labour market but are especially pressured when it seems like men's jobs are under pressure, those young people who are struggling with mental health and drug addictions. So there's this whole raft, I think, of um, quite interesting social policy issues that have been emerging over time that, uh, in my view, have become more and more conservative, not less. Now, I know that people will have, may have a different opinion about that, but what I've seen is this increasing conservatism that education's been also caught up in. Um, so it might not surprise you tonight that I'm going to talk about two issues uh, uh, that I've been involved in quite a lot. 
um, adult literacy and racialised lives, this investigation and researching around racialised lives. And that those two issues have been front and centre in those polarising debates. They've actually um, been quite important in creating moments where we've broken through in the polarising debates, but they've also been important in reinscribing and, and establishing those uh, relationships of power in society. So tonight I want to track some aspects of um, how we come to know ourselves as a country and as a society, not only through learning at school, uh, but through community and cultural learning, uh, through employment and workplace learning, and through lifelong learning. And I've been particularly interested in this notion of public pedagogies also, that I think travels alongside of all that other learning that we do in formal and informal places. Um, and what I've been calling uh, public pedagogies associated with white metropolitan <coughs> imaginaries. And I'll, I'll unpack that as we go. Uh, but I just wanted to say to, in the beginning that um, in using a term such as whiteness, I'm drawing on a, a quite broad body of work called whiteness studies that recognises how expectations of one's ability, uh, where one fits within social and economic employment hierarchies, uh, how respectable and respected one is. These are all couched in understandings of race and particularly of right whiteness that are never actually spoken of much. They're never actually articulated. And in fact, often when I talk to people about the work that I do around whiteness, there's always this desperate question about, talk to me about blackness too, Sue. It's a, it's a quite interesting response that um, when I, when I want to talk about the way that whiteness works in society, uh, there's a, almost a, a button that's pushed that we also need to talk about blackness. Um, uh, but often people also find that pinning down this idea of whiteness is quite difficult. Um, they appear to have no trouble <coughs> pinning down blackness or Asian culture or Indian culture, but trying to uh, shape up and tighten up the boundaries around whiteness is quite difficult. And I must confess that I've been involved in um, agreeing with that over time, in uh, agreeing that whiteness is invisible and intangible and hard to touch, uh, hard to imagine, hard to see, hard to describe. But a lot of people that I've worked with give me quite clear descriptions of what it looks like and what its effects are. So what I'd like to do is take you through uh, some of those um, things that I've been working on through my, my working life. And as I've said, there are two, two particular themes that I'm, I've been trying to put together for quite a, a while. Um, and again, I thank the, the CDU for the opportunity to help me once again do this. Um, my work over this time uh, ha of substantial change in VET was not just about teaching. It involved using teaching and policy resources that weren't always supported by mainstream educational theories. Um, uh, during this time, I noted these two particular themes on the screen here, the central role assigned to adult literacy in social and economic productivity debates. At one point in the 90s, it was almost a, like Australia would not survive if the adult literacy field didn't join award restructuring, if the adult literacy field didn't get on board with industry and help industry become more productive. Um, another issue that's been uh, surfacing in my work is this repeated rejection of the view that whiteness as a discursive system renewing hierarchies of racial ordering might be present in mainstream policy documents, that it might be shaping our understandings of what flexibility, <coughs> inclusion, equality and agency might be. Um, and in fact, those alternative resources that I've been using um, have argued that our lives are racialised in ways that we sometimes don't acknowledge, particularly if we're white, particularly if we belong to the mainstream, particularly if we have a, a, a life that's established within a dominant culture. I think this was probably best exemplified in the 90s for me particularly in the way that Australia's training reform separated out the, the occupational content of packages uh, from the cultural diversity and experience and mix of workplace employment practices. I've got boxes and boxes that I'm hoping Stephen Hamilton will help me to archive at some time of um, <laughs> of newspaper articles, uh, fabulous, fabulous uh, headings, newsline headings, 
of this combination of literacy and uh, employment and racialised incidents in the workplace. And I'm sure that there's a, I'm sure there's a book in them there, Stephen, <laughs> we can work on. Um, activism, though. Someone said to me, what? <coughs> I thought academic activism was, uh, was dead, Sue. Well, it isn't. It's alive and kicking. It's not necessarily street marches. It's not necessarily a raucous kind of behaviour. What I'm focusing on tonight is the kind of thing that I call thinking work. And I think anyone's capable of it. And, and particularly, I think public lectures like this are a really interesting example of how we engage in, in thinking work. Uh, this basically involves the activism that I've been interested in, involves calling out lazy research and policy making people when we use simplistic ideas about literacy and race as the reason for drops in national productivity, uh, and, or low test scores in particular regions. And at the same time, we sheet home the blame for these drops in productivity or low test scores to groups who don't sit neatly within the frameworks of uh, respectable citizenship that are lodged in our national wide imaginary of who, who we are as Australians. And I think that um, I've certainly found that uh, in the classes that I've taught um, and the work that I've uh, learned from, from my postgrad students and people that I've worked with in the academy, that these have been really engaging debates about how we learn to know uh, these things at the interface of where we learn and, and when we're doing policy making and curriculum development. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to open up a conversation about initially um, was my experiences of doing adult literacy work uh, and my work around racial awareness. And I'll begin with a short tour of the international uh, adult literacy surveys that I've been involved in for quite a while now. Um, these are what we might call um, surveys of population competence and um, they challenge the idea that we download literacy in school and that we keep it for life and that we don't have to do much um, to, uh, to upgrade it or fine tune it or improve it. Um, to do this, I'll talk about the surveys um, and uh, provide a brief, if I can, introduction to them. They're organised by the Organisation for <coughs> Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, it's an organisation that promotes policies that have a transnational intent to improve economic and social, being, social well-being sorry, around the world. Um, and these surveys have been used uh, to... Uh, they have a bearing on many things, uh, on funding, on priority target groups. Uh, I've even been involved in uh, professional organisations where the shaping of the surveys and the outcomes of them have resulted in funding of defunding of professional agencies and uh, professional networks. So they're quite interesting, powerful um, tools for informing government and for informing uh, policy makers, but they often have unexpected effects also. Uh, they've influenced research questions that have uh, primed and pushed government policy. Now, one major effect of the survey that I was really interested in, the um, surveys over three years, was establishing this series of five levels of competence from level one to level five. Um, and each domain in the surveys that's assessed around writing, around form filling, around uh, numeracy and uh, information processing, and around problem solving in technology rich environments. That last one, problem solving in technology rich environments, is about the way in which the internet's taking over uh, our lives, mobile devices, tweeting, and so on, and uh, the capacity that we have to engage in literate practices through those environments. So over the years, these surveys developed a set of one to five scaling, with level three being the minimum requirement for participation in daily life. Um, and you can see there we've got um, the IELTS in Australia in 1996, the ALLS in Australia, the, and the PIAC, P Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies. Um, they cost a lot of money, they take a long time to roll out, and they take a long time for the data um, to be analysed and come up with um, what is often a disturbing answer for uh, government and industry that anywhere between 40 and 60 per cent of the average Australian population uh, is, is sitting at level one and two. So, it's a, so I thought um, it would be very interesting tonight to show you a couple of the um, uh, items of the sample <coughs> test. Uh, but before I do that, 
I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the tests. There's the documents from each of the three um, phases of the surveys that uh, I've been involved in. Um, they are uh, run in Australian households as part of the Australian Census Collection. Um, Australian Bureau of Statistics trained data collection people uh, sit with people, Australians, in their own lounge rooms and uh, complete a series of tasks. Often this takes an hour, it might take two hours. There are quite funny stories around the census collection time of people, census people, Australian Bureau of Statistics people, holding babies, washing dishes and doing <coughs> homework with children so that the householder can actually undertake the tasks. Um, there have been a few changes over the years. In fact, the most significant one just recently was the, um, the work of the um, uh, collection of data um, was undertaken by laptops as part of adding this problem solving in technology rich environments. So quite interestingly, the, uh, there are a number of people who can't use computers for physical reasons or they don't know how their lack of coordination, hand-eye, hand mouse coordination won't allow them to participate in the test. So I, I, I'll be interested, I think, to see what happens uh, as we look at the data on those um, first two tests that were done by pen and paper and the newer tests that we've got um, that have been uh, uh, rolled out using a laptop. Um, but just to uh, get you in the mood tonight, here's a document literacy task and it involves working across a document that has no distinct linear prose. Um, some documents involve no text. Uh, then the complexity of the task involves, um, I can see some people at the back who might have to put their, um, their glasses on, and I'm reminded that in the 70s and the 80s when I was interviewing people for literacy classes, that was one of the main reasons that people said they were able to hide their public shame. I've lost my glasses. And I used to understand that until I started wearing glasses and kept dropping them in the garden. So I think we have to be careful about what I've lost my glasses actually means. Um, but what we have here is a, a rather simple item test. Um, in essence, the task asks, what's the percentage of teachers from Greece who are women? Who's got the answer? So there's... So there's brave... Brave... PVC down the front here says 51.2 and I'm, I'm relieved to say that she's correct. <laughs> so thank you, Giselle, yes. So there's a, there's a bit of a distraction there in the item test. The, the top says few Dutch women at the blackboard. So the test is a, it, it requires you to draw information from different parts of the documents. It's not a linear prose exercise. Um, for those of you who are getting warmed up, we've got another one. This particular item was uh, on numeracy, asking people to interpret and evaluate numbers. Now we know that many government services are delivering tax, health and environment, and uh, sorry, welfare services via the internet. Um, so as I said, this 2011-12 most recent data collection was about working on a laptop. So in PIAC terms, its difficulty was reported at level three. So if you're at level three and you can answer this, then you're average, you're going well. Uh, people were asked to click on one or more of the time periods provided in the left panel on the screen, wait for it, where there was a decline in the number of births. So how many declines were there? Two. So which boxes would you tick? The last two, the middle one, the first two? The first two, correct. Good. Now I can see that you're getting warmed up, but when I went through this, I realised that if I did all of the items, then I'd run out of time and wouldn't be able to get to the ending. So I'm just going to skip the next one. <laughs> and I'm sorry that I didn't have prizes for people either. Um, <laughs> but what I've been particularly interested in, I was particularly interested in finding these items because it was quite hard to find the items in the first round. The OECD tests are quite, uh, they're quite protective about the sample items. As soon as they make a sample item public, it's worthless to their, to their testing procedure. 
so you can't actually uh, use it again. So they're quite careful about the number of sample items that they actually divulge to the public. But the ones that they do are on the, there's probably five or six in each item and they're quite interesting to look at what the underlying assumptions about literacy and numeracy are. So, what I've been particularly interested in is how we can talk about this kind of data and the analysis that comes out of it. But I've also been interested in how problems are identified uh, in relation to these surveys and how these surveys are designed to help us understand and solve a problem. So a problem was identified in the 80s and 90s around the increasing cost of welfare services as well as the loss of productivity in Australia. Uh, this creates an economic and social inclu inclusion crisis, but it also creates a uh, cost. Um, the source of the problems targeted, in this case, a lot of the source of the problem was targeted back to language literacy and numeracy and people who sat within level one and level two. So there was a, a lot of talk about how we, uh, I described it as how we drag people kicking and screaming from level one and two up to level three, that minimum benchmark of average uh, performance. But the surveys also were complicit, I think, in activating this polarising discourse uh, of blame about um, who was responsible for turning around the wasteful relationship. What was the, rela what was the relationship like between government, welfare, education and training and the individual? So we can see how this played out in a number of uh, headlines, newspaper headlines. Uh, generally, it was about spelling, poor spelling, or basic maths ability. Uh, every now and then it was about how, how bad standards are and how they're always falling. Every time a survey was released, there'd always be something about how bad schools are these days and why teachers aren't doing their jobs. And I'd have to say that for the most part, a lot of people in the adult literacy field desperately tried to keep that a separate conversation to not start blaming people in schools for the reasons why there was a suddenly a, a literacy problem. In fact, in the 60s, Australia was said to have a 98% literacy uh, rate, that we were, we were all literate. So there is a question about what's going on here. How come we've moved from in the 60s and 70s, 100, 98%, 100% to 40 to 60 percent of people can't read and you'll see that in the last uh, survey 2013 there was one, uh, uh, survey, one survey result that said something like 73 percent of people can't meet the average benchmark here and I'm pretty sure that it was maths. So my approach to activism over all of this time was what, what is going on here? How do we talk about this thing called literacy that so many people have an opinion on and also hooks back into schools. Uh, three things that I kept repeating, a little bit like a mantra. Uh, literacy is not downloaded during school years. We don't, we don't get it for school in life and just use what we've got and fine tune it. Um, if literacy skills aren't used regularly, then we lose them. So it's the old mantra, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't keep your skills up, um, then, then you need to get some kind of retraining. Yes, spelling, counting, writing, introduced at school, all these drill techniques, they are important. We, we all know that we need sometimes to have quite quick responses and that the processing in our head needs to be pretty automatic. We don't want to be sitting there thinking, one and three and five, or what's that? We want an automatic response. And so that's why I think those um, drilling and techniques are an important part. They're an important part of the overall process of education and training. So we need to be able to think quickly. We need to be able to think short term. We need to be able to think on our feet. But programs that are structured around those kinds of um, activities have very little chance of, of supporting adults in particular to develop the kind of complex literacy repertoires that they're required to uh, participate in and perform in daily practice. Um, so the important uh, three things that I was talking about are that it's not downloaded in schools, so you lose it or you, you use it or you lose it, 
and also that uh, it's contextualised and contingent and social. It's, it's, it's in context. So, to the third issue, that it's in context, that are not just downloaded for life, not just use it or lose it. This third issue of the contingent and contextual nature of literacy is directly related to the notion of human capital, which became a popular anchor for talking about what people offered to the national economy. Now, how do you develop the human capital of a country to grow the economy, to grow the nation? And this included not just their occupational and social contributions, but a way of measuring and costing their contributions and aligning this with their literacy. So the OECD defined human capital as the knowledge, skills, competence in the competencies and other attributes. And I've got that little column with the red uh, brackets around these personal attributes that are quite important to my argument tonight. Um, and that these are relevant to economic activity. And this includes, and they're listed there, things such as personality traits, behavioural dispositions, physical characteristics such as strength, dexterity, height, and even personal approach, your personal approach, which may have a value in the labour market. Now, some of you might also have been around when loyalty and humour were a really important part of employability uh, skills. La I can see a number of people nodding. And, and I remember actually writing a paper saying, um, I actually want to work with people who have a sense of humour. But loyalty and humour are such curious things in an employability framework. Um, and I think when I came across these ideas about linking human capital, linking personal traits, and linking such things as loyalty and humour to, um, uh, to employment and to competence and capability, uh, my work started to circle around this I these ideas of the other attributes embodied in the individuals that are relevant to economic activity. So what I've found, um, and I, I want to say, and it wasn't hard to look, it was there, it was everywhere, um, is that these, a lot of the talk in the OECD surveys and a lot of the discussion about the results resolved, revolved around this notion of level three, uh, this average level three. And in fact, many of us said, what about level four and five? We actually need really highly skilled people. Most of the people in this room, I would hazard a guess, are pegging level four and five, and we need to keep improving your literacy skills. So we needed to have a conversation about level four and five also. But these, a lot of the conversation was about level three and about the problem, the drain and the waste that level one and two participants uh, created for the nation. But activism, as I understood it, was contesting the view that literacy was primarily about these technical skills. And it involved using the theories and resources that I'd been acquiring around my work around whiteness uh, to trace how whiteness as a concept was not often considered as a theoretical resource when, the, when we think about competence and capacity. We did think about multiculturalism. We did think about indigeneity. We thought about a range of target groups with associated cultures, uh, women, disabilities, youth. Um, but this connection between the presence of racialised codes associated with literacy, cognition and capacity to be trained, the capacity for someone to actually participate in training, uh, between these themes around comportment and bodily control and manners and sexuality and hygiene and energy, you know, the way people hold themselves, the energy they've got, the get up and go. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, for the purposes of the talk, I'm stretching a quite long, thin bow. There's a, an enormous amount of literature that connects these kinds of uh, colonial practices and colonial images of uh, agentic whiteness with the kinds of work that we're doing in adult literacy, not only in the 90s, but now, today. Um, and the thing that I was particularly interested in was that these connections were rarely spoken about, um, nor were the connections to co-worker and employer perceptions about whether someone was competent, even able to be spoken, because they were actually rendered silent in most of the training packages that I was involved in. 
So I'll just go through this quite quickly. But what I uh, um, <coughs> wanted to raise is this notion of the dictation test, which has been around in um, uh, Australian uh, migration history for many, many years. And for those of you who aren't aware, the um, the dictation test, the dictation test involved uh, actually keeping out. Um, non-white Australians and workers in our white, white Australia policy immigration period. Um, but I've also put up there a $15,000 win for an exploited waiter, uh, which was uh, published on September the 7th, 2015, so only a couple of weeks ago. And both of these instances draw together the commonality of the assumptions about whiteness, about language and about competence, about how people are... Um, uh, how judgments are made about people on the basis of their race, their ethnicity, um, their colour. So throughout all of this, um, I kept coming back in the work that I was doing with uh, policy makers, with community and church agencies, with TAFE people, with vocational education and training plumbers, um, uh, electricians and, and colleagues in the university. Uh, to this idea that education isn't a neutral enterprise, but that we need to be able to track, rather than saying as a mantra, education's not a neutral enterprise, we need to be able to track a bit more carefully just what that looks like, what that tracking of non-neutrality looks like. But also that, it def that the official discourse of improvement that was travelling through the VET sector improvement for participants, improvement for apprentices, improvement for TAFE lecturers also, many of whom came from enterprise into TAFE for, for a range of reasons. Um, that this discourse of improvement never really named the lazy thinking involved in linking rationalised hierarchies with personalised attributes. So it was never contested, it was just there as this silent subtext um, sitting beneath the training packages. So I was particularly interested in how these ideas of whiteness worked in VET and educational policy making more broadly and learning about what these language practices and structures and value judgments and, and prioritising practices actually looked like. And um, fast forward some 20 years uh, from the release of the first international survey um, and not surprisingly, we see a repeat of these complex themes around productivity and development, but also an improvement agenda. And they have um, came to me via computer in the, um, in the guise of our North, Our Future, the recent white paper, uh, recent white paper on uh, developing the North, that the Australian, it's an Australian government initiative and it responds to pressing challenges um, facing Australia in terms of development and economic productivity. It's a seriously ambitious development plan and its focus is set quite early in the document aligned with a now familiar framing of human capital. The document says on page four, more human capital means more dynamism, creativity and innovation. It means more entrepreneurs to tackle the opportunities and challenges of the North and provide the workforce for the cities that will grow there. And my focus is on uh, learning in that document. And in fact, when I read the document, learning is everywhere. It's everywhere in the document, in terms of industry and workforce development, in terms of tourism, in terms of community engagement. But it's rarely mentioned uh, outside of schooling. And I, I think um, in preparing this talk tonight, it did make me think this is something that we really need to think about more seriously. We need to work out how to position this innocuous thing called learning in a more proactive way in such a really important document. But in terms of my previous work on the OECD studies, uh, having Our North, Our Future arrive in my, uh, my inbox uh, helped me to see how these ideas about human capital uh, are quite interesting but also have resonance back to the work that I did in the adult literacy field. So my discussion in the white paper to, about the white paper tonight is really focused on the opportunities for education and training. But this framing of development and human capital 
is also one of the significant signs that the white paper has in mind a form of development underpinned by what I would call that old waste and productivity framework that was so evident in the literacy surveys. And it's clear from the document that the South believes the North is wasting and squandering our vast resources and opportunities that we have up here. I'm very mindful that I've only been in the Territory for um, four years, so I have to be very careful about talking about myself as a Territorian. But the tone and tenor of the uh, white paper is quite interesting, I think, for those of us who are interested in education and learning and professional learning. And there it is there. The, uh, our North, our future. Um, our North's future will come from its people, its ingenuity, its diversity and its proximity to Asia. It's covering 40% of Australia's land mass. Our North has the resources, the connections across the tropics and the land, skills and institutions that the Indo-Pacific region needs. A region that has the savings and the markets to drive Northern prosperity. And all of that will be underpinned by people and their learning, and I suppose what implicitly I've also been talking about as unlearning. Learning and unlearning some of the things that we understand around um, social and economic inclusion. So there were three practical strategies for education in the, um, in the document. Um, and al although there was limited work around learning, and these three practical strategies were around flexible literacy for remote primary schools, uh, school enrolment and attendance measures and remote attendance strategies. So really trying to ramp up the uh, quality of literacy work in remote schools um, and also ramp up attendance in remote schools. Lost my place there. But one of the issues that um, becomes apparent when we're reading these, um, these strategies that are going to underpin educational uh, progress in, in the North and in our, our North, our future, um, our, our North, our future, is um, the new teaching initiatives um, promise to re reduce the disparities between remote and metropolitan learning. But the unspoken message is also that they'll correct teacher behaviour, that they'll actually be a bit of an interruption to teachers who might be interpreting and uh, being creative in um, remote schools in particular. Um, so, a, so a rollout of a particular kind of teaching initiative is going to actually help to provide some solidarity and some uh, focus. And in fact, sometimes uh, that's been called teacher-proofing strategies to reduce the influence of tools, uh, of schools and teachers, uh, and to um, provide admittedly in the, with the people that I've been working with to admittedly provide some stability and some context to those uh, remote schools. So you've got this really interesting tension that in some remote schools people are saying there's such a turnover we, we need something concrete, uh, we need something continuous and permanent. But one of the strategies is to almost remove completely the, um, the capacity people have to be involved in the local delivery of their literacy work. The other um, element, attendance in schools, is more uh, disturbing from my point of view in the way that I've been reading surveys and uh, inquiries, and that is that explicit punishments will be outlined for the families of students um, if they do not fall in line with this, what I would call this one last chance to meet the South's expectations of them as respectable parents, as respectable families and respectable communities. So in this document there's a very clear message that um, the, nor the North, and particularly families in the North, in the remote North, uh, aren't meeting the expectations of Southern capitals and that income support uh, payments will be suspended if people don't um, keep their children in schools. So reading this, was, uh, reading this document was um, confronting in many ways, particularly because of the work that I do um, <coughs> here in the Graduate Centre, engaging with education, engaging with remote communities, engaging with uh, policy and government um, to, to grow education. But it became clear that our North, our future, um, in our North, our future, the case was very similar to literacy surveys. A particular type of human capital was being progressed and valorised. Uh, and it was not the human capital on the ground in local communities, as I understand my work with them. 
So the authors of the white paper are apparently unaware of how they've aligned living in a remote community as other um, to living not only down south but in metropolitan communities and to those people who have successfully dealt with the challenges of living in the north. So we've got these two quotes here on the left hand side, page 132. The document says the people of the north have successfully dealt with the challenges of living and working in the region. Five pages later, we're told that Indigenous Australians of working age who live in remote areas are over three times more likely to be on welfare than other Australians of working age. Uh, we're told the major source of personal income for more than 50% of Indigenous Australians in remote areas is income support. A little further down, we're told a range of factors contribute to higher levels of income support and CDEP in remote communities and very remote communities, including the lack of job opportunities, participation in customary activities, entrenched intergenerational poverty and social dysfunction. So we've got this rather substantial collapsing of remote community life um, that's exemplified uh, by participation in customary activities, social dysfunction and entrenched intergenerational po poverty. I'm not actually saying that some of that doesn't exist and that, some of, uh, and that this is in a complex space. But the authors don't seem to acknowledge how connection to land, land maintenance practices, mother tongue proficiency and relationships with family and clan are also critical in this set of complex relationships. Um, and hence also necessary those particular issues for the next generations who will live in and sustain remote and very remote regions long after this promise of development closes off in 2035, which is the deadline for the achievement of the goals in the, uh, in, in, in the document. While people's opinions might vary, I would argue that it's not always, um, in my reading, demonic and extreme acts of white possession that have caused most damage over the years. Um, rather, I think it's the mundane assumptions about this polarising discourse of worthy and wasteful citizens that best illustrate the racialised knowing at the heart of these latest impulses to improve the North. So in terms of the kind of activism that I, activ I advocate, uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the quite specific moves taking place in these and other documents. Um, I've just noted that it promotes a fundamental separation between a generic population and an Indigenous population. It promotes a further separation between the benefits of Indigenous resources for tourism and economic progress, uh, but doesn't recognise those benefits for uh, relational and education benefits. Um, and it simultaneously ostracises dysfunctional families and families, uh, parents, unwilling communities, recalcitrant traditional owners who refuse to comply with southern or metropolitan views of uh, how, the north, uh, how the south believes that the north should live. Now what I've found, um, so, we, so we have this, this notion of a willing and an unwilling community and my understanding is that the only way in which we can um, construct this willing community is by having an unwilling other, a, a shadow other community. And that's largely established um, through descriptions of Indigenous people's uh, social disfu dysfunction in, it's, it's established by inaccurate descriptions of dysfunctional life in uh, remote communities. So I don't want to be misunderstood there that I'm not agreeing with those descriptions but that is part of the work of creating this willing community in this group of unwilling people. So in um, closing I would argue that uh, even though this quote comes from uh, the states I think that we've got many um, ways in which we can recognise uh, that possessive investments in whiteness are working here, not only in the literacy work that I did over the last 25 decades, but in this new uh, Our North, Our Future uh, opportunity that is being offered to Northern Australia. So George Lipsitz says, uh, the possessive investment in whiteness is about assets as well as attitudes. It's about poverty, property as well as pigment. It does not stem primarily from personal acts of prejudice by individuals, 
but from shared social structures that skew access to resources, opportunities and life chances along racial lines. Um, the only thing I disagree with with Lipsitz there is that I think it does uh, stem from personal acts, mundane daily acts, as well as these major structural issues. And this is most apparent, I think, in the multiple expressions in the document, Our North, Our Future, that actually erase dispossession of land and also labour in three of the major industries across the Northern Australia, uh, nursing, education and the cattle industry. The enormous amount of labour that's held those industries up over the period of time that uh, I've been aware has, has been huge. But I think that these possessive investments in whiteness in not acknowledging that work has been quite critical in, in how we now need as educators and educational researchers to, to start engaging uh, with this new opportunity. I think I might finish there and open it up. I think I might finish there and open it up for questions, actually. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thank you.